I thought I would do something a little different today. I haven't been playing a ton of games lately because I've been working on my own game, Realms of Solace. Now, this game is designed as a solitaire role-playing game, and I've been tinkering with it off and on over the last couple years. Realms of Solace is divided into five sections. Mapping, questing, delving, seafaring, and then a codex. Now, well, what I have here is just the mapping section. Uh, it's a eight and a half by eleven inch magazine format, inspired by a lot of the old magazine games from the nineteen eighties that I've been that I've been playing on this channel. And I may I may also make a pocket version of this rule set, but for now I'm going with this larger magazine format just because I think it's kind of fun. So the mapping section of Realms of Solace allows you to generate a hand-drawn fantasy realm, uh, stock it with civilizations, features, and creatures, and the section can serve as a standalone mapping engine for fantasy cartographers and game masters or it can be used in conjunction with the following sections as a complete solitaire fantasy gaming system. So once you've built, once you've rolled up a map, once you've rolled up a fantasy world using the mapping section, then you can continue to the questing section, roll up adventurers and embark on quests using the worlds that you generated with the mapping section. And then there's uh, the delving rules. So as you're questing, when you reach specific locations on the map, you can actually delve into those locations. And then the seafaring section is designed to connect multiple maps together. So you can roll up several maps and using the seafaring rules, you can sail from one map to another and you can create these large campaigns. And then the codex, is uh, basically this kind of a huge encyclopedia of um, pre-generated maps and characters in case you don't want to roll up your own map or roll up your own character. Additional features and creatures, tables, uh, map drawing tips, and optional advanced rules. So that's kind of how I've structured this game. Today, I thought I would just demo the mapping section and to do that, I'm going to I'm going to start with this blank sheet of hex paper which will come with the game. Right now it's just on the back of the mapping section. But uh I'm going to I'm going to roll up a map. All right, so to roll up a map, all you need is a sheet of the hex graph paper that will come with the rule set and you need 6 dice. I like these small little dice. Now, the first step is to seed the terrain. So we're gonna roll the six dice onto a blank hex map, like such. But once you've rolled your six dice, then you wanna to go to the terrain table here and look at the value on the die and assign that terrain, assign that hex the terrain type from this terrain table. So, um, so this, this five here, uh, is a mountain, so we can just do um, a really simple mountain symbol. Uh, you don't have to be an artist to generate these maps. The idea is just to get the get the basic information. Uh, this four is a hill. This three, you can see it's right in between two hexes, so you want to nudge it on to a hex. The three is a forest. So we'll just draw this little tree here. Um, this one is a wasteland. Let's put a little X on it. The six is a mountain. And the five is a mountain. So now we've seeded, we've seeded our world with these different terrain types. Step two here is to grow the terrain. So for every one of these seeds that we've placed, we wanna fill the directly adjacent hexes with the same terrain type. So for instance, this mountain here, 
we want to grow that mountain seed to create an entire mountain range. So now we have a mountain range here. And then we come down here, this wasteland, we're gonna go every adjacent hex to the wasteland, if it hasn't already been assigned a terrain type, will become a wasteland. This mountain over here will become a mountain range. Uh, this, this forest seed will become a forest. The hill will become hilllands, hill lands, and this mountain now here this hex is, is right on the edge. Uh, if I want to keep if at the end of the day I want this entire world to be surrounded by water, then I would just leave this one blank. Step three is to connect single hex gaps. So for every group of like terrain, for instance here we've got two forests, for every single hex between those two forests, you would add a forest. So you're basically connecting like terrain, to, terrain together to form larger areas of like terrain. But on this map, we don't have any one hex gaps. Like here we have a mountain range and a mountain range, but this is a two hex gap, so we're not gonna connect those. Um, this forest, hill, two different terrain types, so we won't connect those. And then hill and mountain, two different terrain types, so we won't connect those. And then here we, ha we do have a single gap, but it's between a forest and a wasteland, so we don't connect those. So here we're not connecting any single gaps together. The next thing we do is spawn our civilizations. So we're going to roll six dice on our map again. So we nudged them a little bit to get them all back on the map. And then, depending on the terrain type, it's going to dictate what type of civilizations uh, we have. So, for instance, this one down here landed on an empty hex between these mountains and, and, the, and the hills. So, an empty hex indicates a human civilization. So, we just draw a little castle here. And... That one will be placed here. That's actually the size of our kingdom. So we have a size one kingdom, human kingdom here. Uh, here we've got a two and that's empty. So that's also gonna be a human kingdom. Um, we've got a one here. So this is gonna be a size one human kingdom. Now, just for fun, let's nudge this four to this hex, just so I can show you something. The civilization type for a wasteland is actually a dark power. Um, so we're just gonna draw like a, a black triangle here for the dark power. This five is on a mountain. So that's gonna be a Dwarven civilization. Just draw a little diamond there, put a little five in it. And here we have another Dwarven civilization, size four. Now each civilization that we rolled has a size and age and industry, wealth, borders, and relationships with other civilizations. So the next thing we're going to do is go through each one of the civilizations that we rolled and create the stats. So we'll start with the human civilizations. The size of a human civilization is the numeric value recorded on each castle. Now, human kingdom age is the size times 100. So this human kingdom is only um, 100 years old, and we, you know, we can... We can jot that down on here if we want, or you don't really need to, because it's easy to derive the age of a human kingdom. Now, the industry of a human kingdom, there are different types of industry. We've got farming, logging, grazing, mining, fishing, and it really depends on what type of hex, 
the human kingdom is, is next to. So what we do here is for the size one kingdom, we can add one hex of adjacent industry. And since all these hexes surrounding the human kingdom are empty, we can only put farmlands on empty hexes. So the size one kingdom um, will have one farmland. And in fact, if, if we're playing this really smart, we wouldn't, we wouldn't put that farmland next to the dark power. <laughs> Because any human kingdom that's directly adjacent to a dark power is subverted by that power. So uh, if you really wanted to game this, if you don't want any of your human kingdoms to be infected by a dark power, then you would try to avoid adjacency. Sometimes you can't avoid it and they're inevitably going to be uh, subverted. Now the size two kingdom, same thing. It's completely surrounded by empty hexes. So for the size two kingdom, we get to add two um, farmlands. So we'll just put them here. And for this size one kingdom, we only get to add one industry, but we add it to the highest value terrain type. So the mountain is the highest value terrain type. So for this, human kingdom we have to do mountain industry which is mining so this human kingdom is a mining civilization now each industry has a wealth modifier so so farming is each worth one wealth so this human kingdom actually has a wealth of two which is the same as its size this human kingdom, mining is worth three wealth. So this human kingdom, even though it's only size one, has a wealth of three. And this human kingdom only has one farmland, so he has a wealth of one. All right, now we create our borders. This is pretty simple. We basically just draw a line around all the hexes to comprise a human kingdom. You can think of this as like, you know, there are walls around the kingdom and guard posts. And this basically defines the boundaries of each of these kingdoms. And this, obviously there probably wouldn't be a wall all the way up into these mountains, but there's some sort of perimeter, some sort of patrol, some sort of protection you can, for each human kingdom, you can add road segments equal to the size of the kingdom. So for this kingdom, you could add a, uh, a road that stretched on for two hexes. Uh, and then for this kingdom, you could add a road that stretched on for one hex. But roads have to connect to another castle or they have to connect to another road. And right now, we don't really have... Uh, our kingdoms aren't big enough for the roads to go very far, but let's say, let's just say for the sake of argument that this was a size, um, let's say for the sake of argument that this was, that this was a size two kingdom. Now, each one of these kingdoms can build a road that's two hexes long so you know this road would come down here for two hexes and this road would go like this for two hexes and now these two kingdoms are connected um so now we have allies we have trading partners these two kingdoms trade with each other they are allies they are connected and this kingdom is isolated from them Now at every junction where two roads meet, there's a village. Since these two roads basically just create one long road, uh, there is no village here. You could put a village here if you wanted, but typically it would be if there was another kingdom here and there was and they built a road that connected to these two kingdoms, then you have a three-way junction, and that's typically where you would put a village. So we'll go back to our rules here and make sure we got everything. Size, age, industry, um, wealth, borders, roads, junctions, villages. We don't have any villages. 
and now relationships. So all, con all kingdoms connected by roads or sea trading routes are allies. Uh, kingdoms not connected by roads or sea trading routes are neutral, uh, unless otherwise specified during gameplay. Kingdoms are unaware of dwarven colonies and elven realms by default and are thus neutral. Kingdoms are enemies with all dark powers unless subverted by them. All right, so now we move on to elven realms. We don't have any elven realms. Industry, uh, mining is the sole industry for dwarves. And wealth is based on how much mining they do. So what we do is we roll the number of dice equal to the size. So this 5,000 year old dwarven civilization, we roll five dice. We add it together, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. So the wealth of this Dwarven civilization is 18. You know, so you can see how much more powerful it is than you know, this, this human kingdom that has a two wealth or this one that has a three wealth. And then for this 4,000 year old Dwarven colony, we will four dice. And we roll 12, 13, 14. So now we have our, our Dwarven stats. Dwarven colonies don't really have borders because as they grow, they grow downward. They don't expand outward. They just dig straight down. So there is no border on a Dwarven colony. And then finally, relationships. Um, Directly adjacent Dwarven colonies merge into a single Dwarven empire. Non-adjacent Dwarven colonies in a contiguous mountain hex group are enemies at war. So we don't, our two Dwarven civilizations are not connected via the same mountain range. So they are not enemies at war. They're not directly adjacent to each other. So they will not merge into a single empire. Um, so these Dwarven colonies are actually going to be neutral. And then Dwarven colonies are enemies with Elven realms by default, and Dwarves are neutral with human kingdoms by default. However, they are enemies at war with any human kingdom mining the same contiguous mountain group. So we don't have that problem here. So these, these guys are neutral with everybody on the map. And then lastly, we have our Dark Power. Each Dark Power occupies every wasteland hex uh, contiguous to its origin. The number of hexes this includes represents the size of the dark power. Note this on the dark power's origin hex. So um, here we have our dark power and the dark power is basically this entire wasteland and its size one, two, three, four, five, six. So we will write um, a six. And then uh, the dark power's age cannot be determined. There is no correlation between its size and age. A monolithic hellgate can appear in a valley overnight or loom silently over a kingdom for centuries before suddenly consuming it. Uh, dark powers have no industry. They produce goods for the sole purpose of corrupting or consuming all within reach. They have no quantifiable wealth. They are fueled entirely by evil magic. The relics produced by dark powers, though priceless, doom those who wield them. And then borders, each dark power controls all contiguous wasteland hexes it occupies, shade the entire wasteland hex group a darker color, or indicate the affected region on your map. So, you know, you can, you can basically, like, kind of... You can basically use like what, whatever kind of iconography you want here, but you know, you can you can kind of shade this whole thing into a menacing darker color. And in relationships, dark powers which occupy the same contiguous wasteland are enemies at war. So you could have a war between two dark powers in your realm, which could be interesting. Dark powers in non-contiguous wastelands are neutral. Uh, any dark power that borders a civilization subverts it. Subverted civilizations become mindless, ruthless agents of their dark overlords. The gameplay rules for subversion are found in the question rules. So if this civil human kingdom had a farmland that was adjacent to this, the area of influence of the dark power, then this entire civilization would be subverted by it and would also threaten to subvert 
this realm too because they're connected by roads. Now, one thing I forgot to do, any road that goes over an empty hex, uh, that hex becomes grassland. So on a map where you have bigger kingdoms with longer roads, you basically will end up creating a lot of big grasslands can, uh, that sort of connect the different, the different biomes. All right, so now we move on to connecting masses and infill. So now we're gonna look at all groups of non-empty non hexes separated by a distance of only one empty hex, and we're gonna connect those. Now, if either, if, if either side of that one single hex gap is a mountain, then the infill hexes that we're gonna create are gonna be hills. So these would become hills, these would become hills. If not, then they will become grasslands. So how that works is uh, we look at any single hex gaps. So here we've got between two land masses. So here we have a single hex, single hex, uh, and not mountains on either side. So these hexes become grasslands. And then here we have, um, that's already been connected because of the road as a grassland. Here we have one single hex gap between this landmass and this landmass, and neither is a mountain. So this is gonna become grassland. And then down here we have one, two, two single hex gaps and it's between hills and forests, so it's gonna be grasslands. All right, and then the next step is to infill, but after we did this, we did not connect, we did not create any inland sea of empty hexes. If we did, we would infill all of those with grass but we didn't. So what we end up with is we're gonna have this continent that's a very, very strange, this is gonna be a very strange map with lots of um, ithmus, ithmuses. All right, next is coastlines and seas. This is pretty easy. What we're gonna do here is just create basically create a coastline around all connected hexes. And once we've finished the entire coastline, we can kind of see what our realm looks like. Here we have an island that was never within one hex of any other landmass, so it was never connected, so it's its own island. And here we have sort of an oddly shaped thin landmass, just because of the way the dice ended up rolling out. Um, if this mountain range had been even one hex closer to this, we would have connected those two with a hill and then everything inside here would have been infilled with a grassland. So that would have been kind of interesting to have this huge sort of Great Plains prairie land right in the middle of our continent, but that didn't happen. So what we're gonna end up with here is kind of a seafaring civilization. Every human kingdom is gonna have a, a seaport, which actually is the next thing. Um, any castle directly adjacent to a sea hex draws seaport uh, increases seaports, increase a kingdom's wealth by two because of fishing and sea trade. Uh, you can actually create sea routes between seaports uh, with dotted lines and those sea routes can only be as long as the uh, kingdom's size, I believe. Oh, wealth. Okay. So for instance, here we have, we'll create, we'll create a seaport here. 
and we draw a little boat. And this human kingdom has a wealth of two, so really their sea route could only go two hexes, which doesn't lead to any other seaports. So I don't think we're, we're actually going to have sea trading routes, but what we are going to have is fishing. So this wealth of two is going to increase to four because of the fishing port, and same with this one. So wealth of four... Wealth of four, and then this human kingdom put a seaport, and he's gonna have a wealth of five now, but no sea trading because um, one, two, three, four, five, none of them are wealthy enough to actually sail far enough to connect to any other kingdoms. And then the very last thing is, uh, before we move on to features and creatures, is rivers. So for every contiguous mountain group, you can have one river. And so these are the, we've got two mountain groups here. Uh, rivers cannot go through wastelands at all. So for instance, this river, it can start anywhere in here. It needs to start on a mountain hex. Let's have the river actually start at the Dwarven Kingdom because that'd be kind of cool. Maybe that's why they set up their kingdom there in the first place. And this river, after coming down from its origin hex, and put a little asterisk to show that's like where the river starts, the rivers actually follow the, um, the edges of the hexes. So, and it will go between these mountains. Now, if, if the river, if this was not a wasteland, if this was a grassland, the river could actually flow through here into the grasslands and maybe even to these farmlands and increase the wealth of these kingdoms. But it can't do that because there's a, there's a wasteland there. So this river is actually just going to flow through these mountains and out to the sea. So it's a short river. It goes through the mountains and dumps into the sea. Uh, there would be another river here. We'll have the river here start in the middle of this mountain range. And we'll just have it flow out to the sea like such and then we have one more mountain range here now what we can do here we can have this river flow through this human kingdom where they do their mining and we can actually have it flow down here to the seaport if the river flowed by Farmlands, then the kingdom's wealth would increase by two, and if it flowed through grazing hills, the kingdom's wealth would be increased by three. So we didn't have that here. So this, none of these rivers actually benefit the kingdoms, but they create sort of narrative anchors for our world. And rivers can flow under roads, in which case you would build a bridge over the river. There's, there's lots of little rules like that. The next thing we do is create uh, we add features and creatures to our realm and there's just some really basic feature and creature tables here Those will be expanded upon in the codex But what we do we just roll our, our six dice again, and we I'm going to nudge them around and These are our features, so we're rolling features first So let's just nudge each one of these into an actual hex. Okay, and we'll start here. So we rolled a four. We look on our feature table. We can use either one of these, uh, and it's a C, so we can go with a burning C or a deadly vortex. Let's go with a deadly vortex. And here, we can go with uh, Frozen Time or Fallen Tower. So since the Dark Power is right here where we rolled the four, let's go with Fallen Tower. Um, so this is like, this is kind of a narrative element. We have this dark, we have this dark power. It's created this huge wasteland, but at the, at the origin of the dark power is um, is a fallen tower, and then here we have a six on a mountain hex. So we go down here six, 
mountain. Uh, we can go with frozen relic or serax. We'll, let's do frozen relic. Create a little plus here. Now we got a three on the C. Three on the C would be windless sea or a sunken city. And the sunken city has an asterisk by it, which means you can delve there. It's an actual location where you can delve. So let's do that. Let's do um, sunken city. Forest, we got a four in the forest. So we come here, forest four. We, we can go with a rotting grove or hidden ruins. The hidden ruins is a delving location, so let's use that. And then this three landed directly on this human kingdom. So we, we go here, uh, human castle, expand this kingdom by the result, so expand it by three. New hexes can be adjacent to any kingdom hex. Assign industry and adjust wealth, size and wealth accordingly. All right, so that's pretty powerful. So the size one kingdom plus three would become a size four kingdom. And then we can expand the industry. So he gets um, another mountain hex. And he gets some grazing land. So one, two, three, four, and we get one more. Um, so now this human kingdom has suddenly become like extremely powerful because we've got uh, three, six, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, this human kingdom suddenly has a wealth of 13, which also means that it can now create a trading route. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. It can create a trading route to this kingdom. So we draw this dotted line trading route and so now this kingdom trades with this kingdom these two kingdoms trade with each other this kingdom is not a trading partner with that kingdom so they're still neutral and then lastly we roll for creatures so these are pretty clumped together but I'm gonna go with that so we've got a two on a wasteland we can go with necromancer or charred terror um, Let's go with Necromancer. Um, this three landed in the vortex. Let's see what that creates. So we've got a C um, with a three tentacles from below or great sea serpent. Let's do tentacles. from below. So maybe the tentacles from below create the vortex. It's kind of a narrative hook. Here we've got a three also. So we don't want to repeat. So here we have a great sea serpent. Here we've got a five on the grasslands. So we go here to grasslands five. We got one D six bandits or a barbarian. Um, Let's go with bandits, four bandits. And then here we've got a two on a forest. So we've got a witch or bandits. We already have bandits, so we're gonna do a witch here. And then we've got a five in the forest, which is either a mad ranger or a giant spider. Hmm, let's go with the spider. And then we've got a five in the hills. 
So we've got 1d6 lunatics or rabid dogs. Hmm, let's do let's do lunatics. Six lunatics. And then up here we've got a two, we've got a four, sorry, right on the dwarven civilization. So let's check that out. Um let's see, dwarven colony. What did I say? A four? Great invention. The civilization has created a technology that no other civilization possesses, radically altering the dynamic power of the world. So we have a... Um, great invention. All right. So that's pretty much it. And then we have naming and labeling. So we can go through and label all of our human civilizations and you can you can label your mountain ranges this, basically just to create sort of a more narrative experience and uh, and that's it and then finally after some cleanup and some embellishment and a little bit of shading what we have is a world map a realm map that we can then use with our questing rules to roll up characters and go on epic quests within this realm. And we've got feature locations, we've got creature locations, we've got different kingdoms that have different types of relationships with each other, uh, different, different types of wealth, uh, different types of industry. Uh, we've got a dark power, we've got some dwarven colonies. Uh, we've got, we basically have like all these different characteristics of this world interacting with each other to form this sort of narrative that's going to lay the foundation for our adventures. And that's it for now. I think next time I will do a little demonstration of the questing rules. Uh, we'll go on a little adventure on the realm that we just created and, and see how that plays out.